Mr. McCoy here with part 11 of The Secret of the Indian. As you recall, Mr. Johnson, the headmaster, had said, now it just so happens that I have here a copy of Omri's story, which had to be kept by the school when Omri entered it for competition. And what I thought I would, what would be nice would be as if Omri would agree to read us his winning story as this morning's assembly feature. Omri's mouth fell open. Mr. Johnson was handing him a typed manuscript, which he well recognized. He typed it himself, Hunt and Peck's system, in three copies. One he'd sent in uh, to telecom for the writing competition, one he'd kept, and this one he'd had to hand in to the school office. Across the top was typed the title, The Plastic Indian. He clutched it till it creased swallowed hard and looked up at Mr. Johnson imploringly. Now, now, Omri, no false modesty. Telecom has notified the school that you have won first prize in the intermediate age group, uh, 300 pounds, or money in other words. What about that, you people? There was an impressed and envious gasp from the assembled crowd below and Omri heard murmurs of, 300 quid, wow. Get old Omri then, millionaire time, blimey! And uh, they burst into applause all over again. Stand here in the middle of the stage, Mr. Johnson said, maneuvering Omri by the shoulders. Now then, I haven't had a chance to read this myself yet, so I'm just going to sit here and enjoy it. Well done, Omri, off you go. What do you suppose everyone's reaction will be when Omri reads his story? Share with your fellow listener. Omri dithered for a moment or two and then thought, hey, this isn't half bad. I've dreamed of this happening. So he began to read. The story was based on his first meeting with the Indian a year ago when he discovered the cupboard and the key's magic. It was a great story and he'd done his best to write it well. At first, when he began to read it, he was nervous and stumbled over the words, but after a paragraph or two, he hit his stride and began to feel and read with feeling and expression. He did Little Bear's gruff voice and had a stab at Boone's Texas accent. Then he said something funny and the whole audience erupted with laughter. During the exciting bits, everyone sat poised to catch what came next. It was very satisfying, and when he finished the story and the applause broke out again with some cheering, Omri felt this was a great moment in his life, one that he'd always remember. In fact, he was feeling extremely pleased with himself, not at all a sensation he was accustomed to at school, when he suddenly became aware that Mr. Johnson had stood up behind him and was looming over him in a distinctly sinister manner. Before the audience had died away, Mr. Johnson bent down and whispered something in Omri's ear that made his blood chill in his veins. I want to see you in the office immediately. Um, returned to look at him. He was appalled to see that all gentility and geniality had been wiped from the headmaster's face, which had gone the color of a wet sheet. That story, pursued the grim voice in a hissing undertone meant for Omri's ears alone, was supposed to be an invention. I have reason to believe that most of it, incredible as it seems, may be true. Do you think it's going to happen now? share with your fellow listener. Doc Brandt put his old-fashioned stethoscope back in his bag in silence. Patrick, peeping through the frill of cotton lace around the top of Ruby Lou's dress, saw Boone lying on her bed on a brightly colored patchwork quilt. At least he wasn't lying out on the hot desert sand anymore, though it had not been so hot by the time they had finally found him. It was getting dark and Patrick had been scared they'd never find him at all. The horse had been pretty useless. It became clear quite early on that it hadn't a clue where it had left Boone. But Ruby Lou had been absolutely determined to find him. Luckily, Tickle's many and varied talents include amateur tracking. With his help, they had finally found the place where the horse's tracks had rejoined the main trail into town. This had been made possible by the fact that the horse was wearing some very unusual horseshoes. Like some of them from a bygone age, Tick had remarked. After that, it had just been a matter of following them. 
and when they lost them on some hard ground, Patrick had noticed, silhouetted against a magnificent desert sunset, a tall cactus sticking up on the horizon that he recognized. Soon after that, Ruby Lou and Tickle were heaving Boone's unconscious body onto the back of Tick's wagon. Sure must have had a crack on the head or something, squeaked Tick. He's out colder than last week's beans. Doc Brandt said nothing about last week's beans. He was a man of few words. He just packed his stethoscope away and prepared to leave. Well, Doc, cried Ruby Lou anxiously. The old man shook his head. Can't find nothing wrong with him. He's okay, ain't got fever, ain't been shot, nothing but a bit of bruising on the ribs, maybe from when he fell off the horse. Uh, seems like he plumb don't favor waking up. Uh, God pardon sin, Doc. Maybe he's drunk, asked Tickle piously. Look who's talking, muttered Ruby. The doctor shook his head. No liquor on his breath. Can't explain it. Just better leave him lay. When he'd gone, Tickle said he'd mosey over to the saloon to tickle the ivories for a while to soothe his nerves. Uh, you be okay here alone, Ruby? I ain't alone, she replied promptly and patted Patrick. Uh, Pat and me'll keep each other company and decide what to do about Billy here. Tickle suddenly threw himself up to his full height to five feet and intoned in an unexpectedly deep commanding voice, don't you go believe in everything you see. There's a lot of devil's work in this world. I know it. Account of I ain't free of sin myself. And he cast his eyes to heaven before closing the door. Do you hear that? There's a bit of preacher left in him. Uh, even though he ain't held a service since the Dead Eye Gang went through and burned the church down in 81. That's how he learned tracking, uh, trying to chase him was covered with a rich and, from Patrick's point of view, colossal assortment of feminine fancies, a tortoiseshell-backed hairbrush, elaborate bottles of perfume, a number of sepia-tinted photos and heavily worked silver frames, an ivory comb Patrick could easily have sunk and suffocated in the scented powder in a cut glass bowl, and the mirror in its bright enamel frame, above which he could see his head was the size of a reflecting skyscraper. The copper hairpins scattered about were as tall as himself. Okay, Pat, let's hear from you, said Ruby Lou. Who, me, said Patrick, startled. Don't string me no line now. You know what's up with my pal Billy Boone, don't you? It was not a question. Her blue eyes were narrowed as she looked at him, though her wide red lips and her mouth were smiling knowingly. Patrick sat down cross-legged on a white swan's down powder puff. Yes, I do, as a matter of fact, but you don't believe me if I tell you. Try me, Patrick told her. Boone's left his body behind and gone into the future. There was a pause while she took this in. Supposing I say I believe you, and I just might, cause he told me some such tale himself once. Will he come back? Yes, but only if my friend Omri turns the key at, at the other end. Into the future, huh? Is that where you come from? Yes. What year, she asked, as if that would catch him out. Patrick told her. She straightened up. Holy snakes, that's almost exactly a hundred years from now. She walked about the room for a bit. Patrick watched her. Of course, she was rather gaudily dressed, and he supposed she was a lady in name only, so to speak. But when she was at the far side of the room so he could see all of her, it was obvious that she was very pretty. She was clever. Uh, she was clever, too. Cleverer than all those crazy men in the bar who had started shooting and fighting at the sight of him. And she was brave and tough. The way she'd ridden that horse, the way she'd stuck to the search, the way she'd lifted Boone's big body onto the tail of the wagon. Patrick admired her, and she liked Boone. She liked him a lot. Patrick wondered if he liked her. She stopped pacing. What's it like in the future? It's okay, we've got a lot of gadgets and stuff for making life easier. Uh, you get about in cars, that's like horseless carriages, very fast. 
And we've got flying machines. We've got moving photographs uh, that you can have in your home to entertain you. And doctors have found out how to cure lots of diseases so people live longer. Gee, sounds great. Any drawbacks? She was clever. Well, yes, there are too many people, really. Uh, they make a lot of mess, and plenty of them are still poor and starving. There's still crime. And there are lots of wars, not just with guns and bows and arrows and stuff. There are weapons now. I mean, uh, there were weapons then. I mean, well, anyway, uh, they're much scarier. They could blow up the whole world. Ruby Lou strolled back to him and sat down. She put her elbow on the table near him. Her arm was like a great white marble pillar and rested her chin on her hand. She fixed her blue eyes on him. That's quite a drawback, all right. I guess I'll stick around here till my time's up. It gets rough at times, but at least we're too civilized to kill more than one or two at once. Uh, say, they aren't gonna shoot any of them big ones off while Billy's there, are they? I don't suppose so. They better not blow up my Billy, she said, and the way she said it showed Patrick that she didn't just like Boone. What does that mean? The way that she said it meant that she didn't just like Boone. Share with your fellow listener. Patrick spent the night cozily in the pocket of a raccoon skin jacket of Ruby Lou's, which she laid out on a chair for him. She spent the night sitting by the bed watching Boone. Won't you be tired? asked Patrick as she bedded him down after giving him a supper of a few fibers of underdone steak and a crumb of potato washed down with milk from her sewing thimble. Don't you fret about me, pal. I'm used to going without sleep. She turned the oil lamp low so as not to disturb him, and he saw her move to the window. She drew back the frilly curtains. Sky's a funny color she said, peering out into the night. I don't like the feel of the air either. Kind of tight feeling. Hope we ain't in for a big blow. Patrick slept peacefully. In the morning, he awoke with the fur tickling his nose uh, to all the noises of the town. Horses neighing, wheels rattling, dogs barking, cocks crowing, people's voices, but behind and around all was something odd and eerie. A sort of whining, gustling sound. Ruby was standing where he had last seen her, at the window. Patrick sat up in the fur and sneezed. Ruby, he called as loudly as he could. She turned from the window, stooped, and lifted him. Her hand was soft, except for some calluses as big as watermelons, which must have come from writing. It smelled sweetly of soap, and he was trembling. How's Boone? Just the same. Come here and look at the sky. She carried him to the window. He rested his arms along the top of her curled finger and looked up. The sky, and indeed the air, was a strange yellowish color. Below the window, he could see giant people hurrying about. The gusting sound was wind coming in irregular bursts. It caught at the women's dresses and pushed them along. It blew smoke from chimneys away in sudden puffs, like warning smoke signals. It was disturbing the horses, tearing at their manes, flattening their tails to their haunches, making them shake their heads earnestly and uneasily. As Patrick watched, a man's big hat was blown off his head and trundled up the dirt street along with several balls of thistles. A man ran after it. Somewhere a door banged and banged rhythmically as the wind began to blow more steadily. What is it, Ruby? asked Patrick in a worried voice. I'm not sure, partner. I just hope it ain't what it might be. What? Blowing up for a twister. Patrick turned to look at her, but all he could see was the underside of her chin. His mouth had gone suddenly dry. You, you don't mean a cyclone? One of those black funnel things that... Ruby Lou looked at Boone, lying on the bed. She covered him with a rug the night before. He looked peaceful and had a good color. His hat which Ruby had picked up on Patrick's advice, lay beside him. Say, that'd be one for the books, she said with a sudden strained laugh. What would? Uh, we was worrying about what might happen to him there. What if your friend turned his magic key and sent Boone back there, and the bit of him he left behind had been blown, blown clean away? So what would happen? Share with your fellow listener. And now, moments more of The Secret of the Indian.
Mr. Johnson kept his hand on Omri's shoulder all the way to his office as if he thought Omri would twist free and run for it if he didn't hold on to him. And he might have done it too if he hadn't been half paralyzed, at least mentally, from apprehension. He knows those were the only words in Omri's head. What was he to do when the interrogation began as it would in a matter of moments? Lie? Deny everything? Okay, but what if? Then he walked behind his desk, but he didn't sit down. He leaned forward and rested his knuckles on the desk and glared hypnotically into Omri's eyes. Now, Omri, he said in a clear, deep voice, which he used on only the most solemn occasions when someone had done something expulsion-worthy, you know what I have to say. Omri swallowed and stared at him the way a rabbit stares into a car's headlights as they bear down on him. We'll find out what happens to Omri and Patrick as the secret of the Indian continues. <laughs>